Let's go to a moment together. This is a moment that most of us have experienced on one side or the other of the table. But I think the moment is encapsulated by this phrase, okay? This is the phrase. Hmm. Yeah. Whew. I've been there. You know that moment? Okay, this is a moment where you're talking to somebody, like, for example, I have kids that are teenagers now, but a lot of you have younger kids, and, and as, as our kids are older, we've experienced some of the things of your younger kids, and so you might come to us and be like, man, whoo, I'm going through this thing with my toddler, and like, they won't go to sleep, or they're throwing this tantrum, or they won't eat their green beans, and, and you come to me, and you talk about it, and I might be like, whoo, yeah, I've been there. And I might not have any advice for you whatsoever, but at least the thing is, there's this moment because it's a shared experience, and when you know that, whoo, I've been there, you know that you're not crazy. (laughs) You know that you're not alone, and you might know, looking at our older kids, like, okay, maybe they'll survive this. Maybe this will be okay, right? Whoo, I've been there. And this happens all over our life. I know that it's a good feeling because I've been on the receiving end of that encouragement, I could think of lots of times I've been on the receiving end of that encouragement, but one that really jumps out to me. So uh, my family and I moved to Wilmington 10 years ago to start a church, this church. And when we first moved here, we didn't know anybody, and we, it was hard. This, I will tell you, unequivocally, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life is to be a part of a new church. And so, uh, but fortunately, God has blessed me with some great network of other ministers, other pastors, other church planters who have been there. And so there's been a many time when I pick up the phone and I just do, 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 do. Do we still do the do, do noise? I don't think that happens anymore. But I'm calling somebody and I'm just like, okay, all right, I'm going through this thing. I'm going through that thing. And it's kicking my tail. And I have no idea what to do right here. And then often on the other end of the line, that pastor, that church planter, whatever, there'll be some silence, and they'll just be like, whew, yeah, I've been there. And they'll give me some advice, and I get to follow it, or at the very least, I can step back and be like, they'll say, you're going to be okay. And so that's the moment that I want to go to, whew, I've been there. Because I want to know, have you been there? That moment where you needed someone to encourage you, to give you the, you know, the mentoring, the guidance, when you're in the middle of a storm. So we have been studying through the book of Hebrews. And today, if you've got a Bible, I want to encourage you to go ahead and open up your Bible. We're going to dive in. Today, we're going to teach through chapters 5 and 6. But before we get there, we're actually going to read a little bit of chapter 4 because it really sets us up well. Um, so while you look in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5, let me just read for you what is actually one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. If you are in a place in your life right now where you're kind of hoping you could find a reason to believe in Jesus, this passage is a good one. If you are in a place where you've been like living for Jesus for a while, but you needed some reminder of why you call Christianity your faith, this passage is a good one. This is Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 14, okay? And this will be on the screen behind me. This is going to set us up for our chapter. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, we're going to be in the Bible. We're going to be in chapter 5. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, I've we've got free ones that we give away back here at the, the, the um, shelf back there at the door. Feel free to grab one. Look it up on your phone. Um, but we are in the book of Hebrews. And as we approach chapter 5, let me remind us of a few key things we've talked about along the way. And the first one is this. The main kind of overarching theme of the entire book of Hebrews is something like this. We serve a God who speaks to us. And throughout history, he's done it in many ways, at various times. And so the message of Jesus, though, is God's greatest message through his greatest messenger. And so what he's going to do throughout the entire book, and we've seen it already a couple times, is he's going to review some of the great messengers from the Old Testament story. He's going to talk about their message, but then he's going to show how Jesus either fulfilled that or like, uh, you know, transcended it in some way. And so, for example, last week we talked about one of the most revered figures in all of Jewish history, perhaps the greatest figure in the Old Testament for many, the person of Moses. 
And so Moses is the lawgiver. And all of a sudden, we get this, this picture in the book of Hebrews where the guy says, listen, Moses was great. Moses brought us to law. He did all these good things. But Jesus, Jesus is an even higher uh, position in the household of God than Moses. And so this puts us in a new place. Uh, the week before that, we talked about angels, God's most powerful messengers. And they've got an immense amount of power, and they've got all these big things that they share. But he says, listen, Jesus' power and his message is greater than even the angels. And so that's kind of where we've been so far. And, and this week, as we look at chapters 5 and 6, and you might have picked up on it in that passage we just read, we look at a different group of messengers. Probably the most prominent group of messengers in terms of like how many there were, and it was the priests. The priests were instrumental in what it meant for human people to communicate and, you know, interact with their God. And there, there are countless ways in, that God could have presented himself to the world. But the way he chose to do it was to come to earth himself as a human being called Jesus and kind of take the place of the priests that were existing before him. So you might not know a lot about the Old Testament priesthood. Don't worry. We're going to talk about that just a little bit in a second. Uh, but I want to review the verse that we just read from Hebrews 4, verse 14 and following. Because there's that moment. Whew, I've been there. He says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. So there's this concept about the priesthood. So no matter what religion that you're talking about, most of them have some sort of priestly figure. Someone who was the intermediary between humans and God. And there's this mentality that those people are somehow other-ish. They're, they're better than us or they're on a different, you know, we put them on a platform. Even as a, a pastor in a modern Christian church, uh, we, I get this a lot. People are just like, you know, they, they think of me in a different way and they call me special things and they want to put me on this pedestal and I'm like, you got to understand how wrong you are in that. I'm just a dude like the rest of you that I went to a different college, got a different education and I happen to be a public speaker, speaker and, and an organizational leader. Like that's what I am. I'm just another person in the body of Christ just like you are, okay? And so but there's this mentality about the priesthood that it's, they don't get me. They don't understand. And so this is, you know, we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who was tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. And this is talking about Jesus. He's not some, you know, figure that we can never relate to. He came to understand. And then verse 16 says that the reason that he did that was so that we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence so often in our approach to God we're nervous about it I'm not good enough I've got too much junk in my life I'm not good at praying I don't know what's in the Bible if only people knew what I had going on in my closet but God says listen I came down so that you can approach my throne full of confidence you can come worship me the fact that we can come and sing the songs that we just sang that one of our, our teenagers Isaac just prayed on behalf of our church He's not a priest wearing special garments. He doesn't have some special identification in the kingdom. We all have the ability to approach the kingdom of God with confidence, and the throne of God in confidence. So that's that setup. When you ask someone, who is Jesus? You might get a lot of really good answers. Like one answer you might get from a lot of Christians would be that like Jesus is the son of God. You probably heard that, right? I've said it plenty of times. God in the flesh, good answer. Who is Jesus? He's the son of God. He's God in the flesh. Early Jewish believers would often call him the Messiah, so this is the chosen one of God who's got a plan. He's gonna, the word Christ, by the way, is the Greek translation of the word Messiah. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's just, it's a title. Also very true. Who is Jesus? He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. You could also call him Savior because of the act on the cross and his resurrection and the fact that our sins can be forgiven. That's, he could be called the Savior. He should be called Master and Lord because that's the position he holds in all of creation. Another great title, but one that you might not think of very often is Priest. You ever think of Jesus as a priest? You kind of think that like, the priest works for Jesus maybe. But he's, he's called the priest and not just the priest and not just another position which is called the high priest, but this passage calls him the great high priest. So let's jump in now to Hebrews chapter 5, starting at verse 1. And he's going to give us a little bit of background on the priesthood because probably we don't have a good handle on it. We didn't grow up in the, the Jewish Old Testament legal system, so we don't maybe get it. So this is a little bit of that. It says, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. That's basically the role of a priest. So the nation of Israel, we'll pause right there, but we'll come right, we'll pick up on the next verse in just a second. The nation of Israel at the time was divided pretty 
cleanly into 12 groups. They're family groups. They called them the 12 tribes of Israel. There was one specific tribe or family group that was called the Levites. Their forefather was Levi. There were 12 brothers at one point, and Levi was one of them. And the Levites were the group that were selected by God to be the priestly family. So to become a priest, you had to be a Levite to start with. Nobody else was allowed to be a priest, only the Levite family. And among the Levites, only a few, a very spare few, were chosen to be what was called the high priest. It was a process for uh, selecting the high priest, and it was the job of the high priest to be really the chief administrator of all of the temple duties. So there might be a lot of Levites working as priests in and among the temple. I mean, literally down to just like cleaning the floor and like taking short care of some kitchen duties and like some more mundane stuff, all the way to some big things like actually performing the sacrifices and stuff. But their boss, their leader was the high priest. And the high priest would often stay in office, as it were, because it was almost a political position too. I mean, they, they were very much led by the high priest, the whole nation was. That person would probably keep that job for life. And so similar to maybe our Supreme Court, right? And so you get kind of probably an old man becomes the high priest, and then he stays the high priest until he dies. Uh, occasionally there was exceptions. Now, uh, in general, these guys were pretty good, um, but there were some bad ones. It's when you put humans in leadership, there can be corruption. But if they're doing it right to be the high priest and to perform these duties, there was a lot that went into kind of staying worthy of being high priest. And so there were ritual purification rites, and there were washings that they had to do, prayers that they said, and a special diet that they all, all kinds of stuff that they did. They couldn't touch certain things. They couldn't go certain places. They couldn't be with certain people. And so they did all of this because it was like this um, very intentional holiness quest that they were on. Because they had the unique privilege of doing something no other person in the nation could do. There's the temple, okay, that's the main building where worship happened and sacrifices happened. But inside the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, or the holiest place, or the holy sanctuary, the inner sanctuary. And in this place, only the high priest could go. That's why he had to be so clean and have all all his ducks in a row and mind his P's and Q's and all those meta, whatever. Because in this place, in the Holy of Holies, God allowed his presence to dwell. Did you hear what I said? God allowed his presence to dwell to dwell. If you've been around the church long and you read some of this before, you might be like, yeah, God's presence dwelled in the Holy of Holies. But what? What does it mean for God to allow his presence to dwell? I don't know. I don't know. There's been artistic uh, depictions of just how maybe it was just glowing from the center of the building. I don't know. But what I do know is that God said, don't go in there unless you're supposed to be in there. If you do, you will die <laughs> because it's such a holy place so that's this is the this is what the high priest's job was to he wore bells on his clothes just in case like he died in there they wouldn't hear the bells anymore and they'd be like let's they'd have a rope around him pull him out like it's like this is how serious they took the presence of god by the way we should learn a lesson from them god's presence isn't something we should take flippantly that's the role of the high priest so all that, that was a lot of extra stuff right but now you kind of get a picture of what it means to be the high priest look at verse two It says he, we're talking about the high priest, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. I love this because just like I said before, he's just human, just like a pastor, just like a church leader, one of our elders. He's just human like anybody else. So he gets it. He's subject to weakness himself. This is why he has to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for the sins of his people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Who was Aaron? Aaron was a Levite. He was actually the very first high priest, and we talked about Moses last week. Aaron was actually Moses' brother. Moses was a Levite. And so there's a little history there for you. So even after all this effort that the high priest puts in to like become ritually, ceremonially clean, even after all that effort, he still has to offer sacrifices on his own behalf. Why? Because of sin. And so, I mean, the, the, the snapshot picture of sacrifice is like, your sin separates you from God. You, you are deserving separation from him. A word for separation from God is death, okay? But the blood of this animal sacrifice can temporarily atone for your sin. And so there was a lot of that in the Old Testament time. This was God's plan. Uh, don't question it. It's just what was in there. You can understand it. You can study it. But that's how God dealt with sin. And so... The high priest had to offer sacrifices for himself as well. Now, over the course of thousands of years of Jewish history, there would have been, I don't know, hundreds of high priests. Because built into the high priesthood was 
was a, a natural problem that came with them. One, they were human and they were subject to failure, but that wasn't the problem. One of the big problems was that they died. <laughs> they just kept dying, like, you know, how humans do. We're real bad about that. Like, we can only live forever. And so you would become a high priest, but then when your term was up, if you passed away, if you got too old to perform your duties, now some new person has to come in and do it. And with that constant changeover and that connection with God, there was often corruption in the temple. There was often things that didn't go well. And if you look at the Jewish history, one of the biggest problems they had was when the priests just quit doing their jobs the way they were supposed to. There were times where the, the whole Bible was just lost. Like, no one was reading it. Just no one was reading it. It was just somewhere in the temple. And then a couple generations later, they're doing spring cleaning. And they're like, what is this big scroll? <laughs> Let's read it. Oh, my goodness. We need to get back with God. So that was the built-in problem with the priesthood is that they were human and they were temporary. So God had in mind a system that would be more perfect than that. What if he himself could come into the world and take the role of high priest, being the person who can both offer the sacrifice and be the sacrifice and never die? Jesus is the great high priest. So if you pick up in verse 5, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming high priest, but God said to him, and I told you all through the book of Hebrews, we're getting quotes from Old Testament passages. He's going to quote a couple of passages from Psalms here. This is, the kind of, uh, this is kind of God telling Jesus what his role would be. In one passage it says, you are my son and today I have become your father. And this was applied to like the idea that Jesus would become God in the flesh. We've talked about that a lot. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Don't get lost in the word Melchizedek. We'll get back to that. Okay, But you are priest forever is the idea. So through Jesus, God would be establishing a new priesthood that wouldn't die and wouldn't be corrupt because you're the son of God, not a human person, and you're not going to die physically because you're eternal. You're God. You are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So we could talk a lot about this little passage. It's a quote from Psalms. It's only the second time that we hear about this person, Melchizedek. And instead of talking about it a lot, I'm going to encourage you to go read chapter 7 of Hebrews and see what you find. It's a lot of good stuff in there. I literally had about two pages of notes on that that I was like, I don't think that's going to get us anywhere today. Go learn about Melchizedek. He's pretty awesome. But the purpose of a Melchizedek comes from the history of him. And so uh, he's a bit of a mysterious character in the Old Testament. And what we see is he shows up in Abraham's story in Genesis. And this is all we know about him. He shows up. He is called a priest and a king, okay? That's his titles he gets. And Abraham is really impressed by Melchizedek. So much so that Abraham, who's very wealthy at this time, makes a huge offering to Melchizedek. And then Melchizedek just kind of steps off stage, and he's gone. And so all of Jewish history is like, who was that? And there's speculations, and there's some pretty cool theories and all this stuff. But they're like, who was that? So, but he was just this legendary figure because he, he didn't kind of have a family of origin. We don't know his, his lineage, which was a very important thing in their priesthood. But Abraham recognized him as a priest. Abraham gave him this homage and this like, uh, offering that he gave him. And then, not only does he have no lineage that he came from, so we don't know where he came from, he just steps off and it's kind of like, in a legendary fashion, he never died. I'm not saying Mes Melchizedek never died. I don't think that's true. Uh, but in a legendary status, he kind of got, he kinda got this, this, big, this, this, this persona in Jewish history. So then the psalmist comes along a couple hundred years later, and this is what the Hebrew guy quotes. He says, you are a priest in the order of Melchizedek. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, which kind of adds to the legend of Melchizedek. And so the Hebrew writer applies this whole idea of Melchizedek to Jesus. Because whereas Melchizedek was kind of a legendary figure and, we, and mysterious, we didn't know a lot about him, we do know Jesus is eternal. And he is living forever. And so it's like, you know what? You're not going to be a priest in the order of Levi. Jesus wasn't even a Levite. Does anybody know what tribe Jesus was from? Anybody? Judah. Yes, Judah. His tribe of Judah. He wouldn't have been allowed to be a priest. I mean, he's Jesus. He's like, I'm, I'm going to be a priest. But he wasn't a priest in the order of Levi. He gets kind of this whole new priesthood, Melchizedek. So that's, that's pretty like seminary level stuff. You don't need that for heaven, just so you know. It's, you're good. You won't have to know that. But it's cool. It's very interesting. But what really matters is this role that Jesus takes in our life. Because unlike a Levitical priest whose highest aspiration might be to be the high priest, Jesus gets this new title, the great high priest of a different order that never ends, priest forever. And there's a really important part about that. 
Uh, we're going to find out in a second. So in verse 7, we're going to pick up now in verse 7. The writer shows us how Jesus performed his priestly duties. Chapter 6, verse 7. So during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. So even while Jesus was on earth, he does priestly type things. He's praying on behalf of the people. He's praying on behalf of himself. That's something that a priest would do. Verse 8. Son, though he was, he learned obedience through what he suffered. If you, if you remember week two of this series, and if you didn't listen to it, go back and listen to it. It's an important part of the Jesus story. Uh, Jesus lived a tough life. He was born into a, a, a situation where it was really difficult for him. His mother was he's like out of wedlock because of a miraculous birth, and so he had that kind of like stigma going on with him. But not only that, they weren't like wealthy people. They were, labor, they were day laborers. His dad was probably like a construction worker of some kind, maybe a stonemason or a carpenter. We've traditionally called him a carpenter. Like this is a guy who's not raised in wealth. And then beyond that, in his professional ministry, he's basically poor. He says he doesn't have a place to lay his head. He's relying on the generosity of other people to even feed him. And through all of that, it says he suffered. And we talked about in week two that that's how he became kind of the perfect sacrifice for us. He showed us what does it mean to live the character of God, to live in humility, to live in love. And so just like the Levitical priesthood where they had to do all these religious rites and washings and all these things to pur purify themselves and be made like worthy of being a priest, Jesus purifies himself through his suffering we pick up in verse 9 and once made perfect he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him so when you think of Jesus you might not think of him as a priest but maybe from now on you can because that's a really important role historically between how we relate to God is that someone is there for us someone can say this is God this is what he wants from you and let me kind of take that to God on your behalf and Jesus said I'm going to take that once and for all priest forever so that's the basic idea so if you've ever wondered what happened to the Old Testament priesthood like what happened to those sacrifices in the temple there's a lot of answer to that question like generations and hundreds of years of history but uh, what, what we need to know as Christians is Jesus replaced all of that he comes in and he takes the place of the old priestly system and he perfects it and he makes it so that we don't have to go every year to the temple for the special uh, sacrifice. And we don't have to do all these uh, ritual cleansings. We don't have to do all these other things. He doesn't have to cleanse himself every day to make sure he's pure. Instead, we have him as both the priest and the sacrifice, risen from the dead to become our Lord and our King and our Master and the great high priest. So, pause that thought, okay? Because the writer's about to take a shift that in the moment might not really make sense but as I really studied through it I think that it really adds up uh, be, there in the book of uh, of Hebrews there are five warnings that we get um, we identify Hebrews a lot of time as a letter because we have a lot of letters in the Bible and it is kind of a letter it's written and it's circulated they copy it and they send it to different churches but at its core it's really not written much like a letter it's written like a sermon and so all throughout this sermon You've got all these instructions, and there's five of them are warnings. So we've covered a couple of them already. Uh, there was a warning against straying away from God. That was the first warning. You might remember my story about me and my buddy that went on a road trip, and we ignored all the signs, and we ended up getting, like, turned around and lost. Like, that was the warning, straying away from God. The second one was a warning against disobedience. That was last week. And so this week, we get into a third warning, and this is a warning against immaturity. A warning against immaturity. I was a youth pastor for 10 years before I got into this phase of my life. Uh, and I still serve with students all the time. I love working with middle school, high school students. Uh, we ha I'm so pumped that we have our new youth minister, Perry, with us here at Venture. The reason that we have Perry is because of my connection with youth ministry. And last summer, he needed an internship, so we connected. I love working with students. I say all that to say, what does it mean to be mature? <laughs> This is a warning against immaturity. Uh, I have spent hours upon hours sitting with like middle school boys and just, you haven't lived until you've sat with that group of boys and you've listened to them talk about all the noises that their body can make. Um, and it's impressive. I mean, it's a, and what's even more impressive is how they can then creatively reproduce those noises with other parts of their body. I mean, it's amazing. I'm blown away. If you haven't experienced this, then come on. Are you even living? So to, to get street cred as a youth minister, you've got to be able to, you know, hang, right? And so like, do you know the armpit trick, right? With the hand, right, dude. I could teach you. I'm the master. Okay, if you want to 
What does it mean to be mature? Does it make me immature that I would talk about that stuff? And that stuff? No, because maturity is kind of a moving target. It's relative to where you are in life, maturity. A four-year-old is killing it if they can get their shoes on, both of them, that match on the correct foot and tie their shoes. And you're like, <laughs> nailing it, Harvard bound. Like, this is a genius, right? A 40-year-old might change vocabulary and start using words like pruning shears, you know, lawn fertilizer, 401k. Like, so what is maturity? It's, it moves as you grow and you change, right? You get that. I mean, I'm not teaching you something you don't know. We're all in different places, and it's fairly obvious, though, when someone is immature. We see that all the time. He picks up in verse 11 now. He says, we have much to say about this. About what? Well, he's talking about Melchizedek and the priesthood. And it's pretty deep stuff. He's like, we got all, a, lot of, a lot of stuff to say about this. But it's hard to make it clear to you because you are no longer trying to understand. Have you ever hung out with an immature person? Like, I've been trying to explain this to you, but you don't seem to really want to grow. Verse 12 says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone else to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. He's slamming a couple of people right now. He said, you need milk, not solid food. He's going to use this food metaphor to describe spiritual maturity. He says, anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but the solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So what does it mean to be mature? Just like in social maturity and developmental maturity, it is relative. You know, praise the four-year-old who is putting their shoes on the right feet. But the 40-year-old should have that figured out by now, so it's kind of a relative thing. So, you know, first thing I think it's important to say is it is okay to be young in your faith. We've used this phrase for years, baby Christian, right? But that's not a slam. If, you've, if anyone's ever called you a baby Christian and you're new to the faith, they're not cutting you down. Have you ever been mad at a baby for being a baby uh, maybe, maybe you have. Okay, if you're a parent, maybe you've been mad. But like, not really. Like when a baby like can't roll over, you're like, I mean, you're a baby. You haven't done that. But then when they do roll over, we're like, yeah. In your 40s, you might struggle to roll over sometimes. But you should have that mastered by now. So we celebrate development of babies. And so when it comes to being a young believer, we celebrate that. You got big questions? Yeah. You got doubts? You got fears? You don't know about the Bible? You don't know how to pray? You don't... That's fantastic. That's fine. That's what we're here for. We want to help people grow as they're young in their faith. It's completely acceptable because it's, you know, maturity is relative. But if you have been in the faith for a while and you haven't moved beyond the very, very basic stuff of Christianity, what are you doing? What are you here for? What's the goal for you? And I think to some degree the church, capital C church, nationwide, especially in America, we've been a little bit guilty of doing a lot of nothing but milk feeding to our congregations. But still, it's every person's responsibility to grow their faith. It's not, it is not my responsibility to grow your faith. It is not our elders' responsibility to grow your faith. It is your responsibility to grow your own faith. You got questions? Yeah, come to people who you could ask questions to. That's fantastic. But if we just hang out being like, I got my get out of hell free card in my wallet and I'm good, that's not the purpose the purpose is to live in the active kingdom of God now and to live out the principles and everything of Jesus in this earth and to make this place a better place. That's why we say shine light in dark places every week. And so this is a conversation about maturity. And so then we shift over into chapter 6 here. This is like a, we made it to a new chapter. Chapter 6, he keeps talking about maturity. He says, so therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings of Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundations of repentance from acts that lead to death, that's sin, or in faith in God, that's basics, or instructions about cleansing rites and the laying on of hands. And so this is talking about things like, you know, how do you become a Christian? It's about baptism. It's laying on of hands is about praying over people and different things. I mean, it's, it's basic stuff. The resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment, like that's basic. If you've ever been to church on Easter, you get it. Like Jesus rose from the dead and that's part of the faith. So these are basic things. And he says, and God permitting, we will do so. We've got to move beyond the basics. And so if, if you feel like you only know the basics, hey, that's, that's okay. If you know the basics, that's where you start. But can I encourage you, based on this warning, it's really important to you take some initiative and grow. And part of that is intentionally inserting yourself into community. 
being part of this thing like every week as often as you can or, or being in your Bible on your own or praying with your family or taking those steps that are going to be initially uncomfortable, but God permitting, we will do so. It's going to happen in verse 4 because this is, this is kind of the bomb that he drops. He says, it's impossible for those who have been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and is shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. It is impossible for someone who has all the knowledge about Jesus and his salvation and the goodness who just eventually say, eh, I don't want to do it. They've fallen away. It's It's impossible for them to come back to repentance. That's a strong statement because we say things like this all the time at our church. You're never too far gone. So there's a balance there because I do believe there's grace and I do believe there's a place where it's like, I mean, some people get real far away and then they come back. But according to this writer, there, there's like a point of no return. He said they've fallen away. It's, hard, it's impossible for them to come back to repentance. To their loss, this is why it's so hard. They're crucifying the Son of God all over again, subjecting him to public disgrace. So why do we have this warning about immaturity right in the middle of this talk about the priesthood? Because eventually, if we don't take our faith seriously and try to become more mature, we will get to a place where we just throw it away. Um, there, this is an example of that. This has been this sad trend in the last several years. This probably happened for decades and centuries, but it's really been prominent probably because of social media, of, of prominent Christian leaders. I'm going to call them celebrity Christians. Okay, so maybe they're like huge mega church pastors or authors or, or celebrities who are Christians. And, and these people who will uh, give up their faith publicly or they'll have a huge moral failure. And one of two things, and that's sad by itself. I'm not judging them. I'm not saying that I'm like, I feel, I have my heart breaks for them. But this is the, the sadder thing is that there are people that are their fans. You know, they're Christians and these are celebrity Christian fans. And then because the celebrity Christian falls away, or has a big falling out, the people who are following them give up on their faith. And why is that a problem? It's a sign of immaturity if your faith is in that other Christian. Because that other Christian, just like the early priesthood, they're just human. They're subject to failure. They're gonna, they, they have room to make mistakes just like the rest of us. And the problem is if we don't take ownership of our own maturity and we're like... Riding on the coattails of somebody else's faith. We're guilty of this with our parents sometimes. Why are you a believer? I don't know. I grew up in church. Well, that's great. But if we don't take the time to grow in our own faith, what happens if the people who we rely on, what if they struggle? And they're going to struggle. It starts to erode our own faith. I hate to spend too much time saying it's impossible for you to come back to repentance. Because I think that there's, there's a big old gap there where you can you've got a lot of grace (laughs) there's a lot of time to come back but I think the warning is fair just like when you're driving down the road and there's like sign after sign after sign that's like road closed road closed road closed bridge down whatever like you should probably not go down that path and so the warning here is don't go down the path of immaturity it's dangerous down there and you have a choice just like last week as long as still today there's still a chance to obey God and so this warning kind of echoes that when it comes to maturity um I read a commentator this week, and I love this phrase. It says, there is a difference between being childlike in our faith and being childish in our faith. Dang, that's good, right? There's a difference between being childlike in my faith and being childish. Because if you're childlike, like if we, Jesus says we should have faith like a child. It's okay to be childlike, to have a sense of, uh, a, a sense of naivete or like you don't know things, you got questions. It's okay. That's fine. We don't get mad at children for being childlike. But when you're being childish, it's, all, it's obvious. Because it's like when you look at a child and you're like, you should know better. Right? So I don't know if I'm talking to everybody in the room, but I got to feel I'm talking to a lot of us. I'm in the same group. We've got to own our own maturity. And we've got to grow a bit beyond drinking just spiritual milk. Skip ahead to verse 10, okay? This is where we're going to wrap, wrap up here in Scripture today because th- there's always hope, okay? There's always hope. The writer of Hebrews, he drops some pretty, uh, s- some, some bombs on us, right? But then he always comes back to hope. I love what he says here. He says, but God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown to him to help his people and continue to help him. 
He's not unjust. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. God sees you trying. Your perfection isn't possible, okay? We're none of us going to get it right. And it's not, that's not how we earn God's grace in the first place. He sees that. Uh, I was a, a, a football coach for a while, and, um, you know, we had two different kind of players. You, you had one kind of player who's just naturally gifted. Oh, my goodness. Like, just they can throw, they can run, they've got all kinds of skill and coordination. But they were lazy at practice because I'm good. I'm a rock star. Like, then the other kind of player was they couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. Okay, they're uncoordinated. They're not athletic. Their mom signed them up to be there. They would actively say every day, I don't want to be here. Oh, we run, put in the reps. We can't win if you don't. I don't want to win. I don't care, right? They're there. But there's those. Um, but among those people who don't have the, the coordination and the skill, there are some who just, they are the hardest working kids on the team. They put in the time. They're maybe not athletically gifted, but they try the hardest. Let me just ask you a philosophical question as a coach. Which player do you reward? We're not talking about football today. Let me ask you this question, or just state this. God is not impressed by how many touchdowns you can score. Some of you started with a leg up. You grew up in a really strong family with solid, maybe Christian values, and, and like you just kind of, you got a head start. And so like really kind of Christianity is pretty easy for you. You didn't fall into any of these things. Maybe you've never struggled with addiction, and maybe you've never had a broken marriage. Maybe you've never had uh, a big thing of sin in your life. And so maybe it's just easy for you. And some of you haven't had it so easy. Some of you grew up in brokenness, or you've had seasons of disobedience, or maybe you're struggling through addiction or, or a bad relationship or a bad marriage, and there's sin in your life, and you're struggling. One, we all serve the same God who is our high priest, who makes up the difference, and he sees what you're doing. I think the goal here is that we just show up and put in the work. That every day you wake up and you say, I'm here to do it. You might call that faith. Some of that's called works, like you're doing the good things for God. But we're just, we're living in the game. Jesus is our Lord, and we're serving him with all of our heart. So this worrying about immaturity comes back to the question about being a high priest. Because I think one of the greatest things God has done for us is to come here, not just as this kind of overlord, supreme deity God who just says, now thou shalt, you know, believe in me. But instead, he came down and became human. He says he was tempted in every way, yet did not sin. He stubbed his toe. He had to be hungry. He had to be dirty. He had a hard day of work, like a lot of us had at the building yesterday, shoveling gravel and moving rocks. Like, I mean, he's been there, and that, in that way, as that type of great high priest, we can go to him and Approach his throne with confidence and tell him what's going on in our lives. And he can say, whew, yeah, I've been there. And he reaches down, the book of Ephesians says, and he lifts us up out of our sin, out of our mess, and he seats us with him in the, in the heavenly realm. He offers us forgiveness. He offers a next chance, and it all, and all happens because of his grace. So let's go back to the verse that we started in, Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore... Since we have a great high priest who ascended to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the promise we profess. For we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, yet did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let me pray for us this morning.